cast your minds back to the year 1998. Or, if, like me, you were not born yet, just try to imagine it for a second. It's almost the turn of the millennium, Disney is at the end of its renaissance, not that anyone knows that yet, and Warner Brothers would like a slice of the animated musical pie. And Disney hasn't really had much luck with Arthurian legend yet. Sure, the sword in the stone exists, but it's not a classic. Still, Disney's already done their spin on Arthur's origin, which means if Warner Bros. wants to avoid being accused of writing their coattails, they have to do something different. Enter Quest for Camelot. Quest for Camelot is a lot of things. A box office failure, one of the best examples I've ever seen on how not to integrate musical numbers if you want them to feel in any way natural, and the origin of the song The Prayer, which was a truly wild fact to just stumble on during this. It's also, surprisingly, not that terrible when it comes to disability representation. For the most part. But first, let's briefly go over the movie itself. It's very loosely based on the book The King's Damoiselle by Vera Chapman. And I do mean loosely. I haven't read the book myself, and based off of its Wikipedia page, I have absolutely no wish to, but the differences are stark even just from a quick scan. So from here on out, I will for the most part treat the movie as entirely separate from the book except in a few key places where the difference actually really matters, and for the context that the main character is supposed to be Lynette. The movie follows the adventures of a girl named Kaylee, though, which is such a jarring name to hear in an Arthurian context. I tried looking it up, and as far as I can see, this isn't a case like with Tiffany, where an actual medieval name gained so much popularity in the modern age that it sounds out of place in contexts where it very much belongs, they just decided that Lynette wasn't a good enough name for some reason, I suppose. And while we're here, I gotta say, you can't have it both ways. Either Kaylee is a humble farm girl with big dreams, or she is the daughter of a knight. I understand if they wanted her to be more relatable, or whatever, but all of the characters in the movie talk like her family is nobility, only for her home to be a tiny, isolated farmstead with a couple of farmhands at best. Anyway, Kaylee is the daughter of Sir Lionel and Lady Juliana. Sir Lionel is an actual figure in Arthurian legend, though notably is not Lynette's father, nor a particularly loyal knight of the Round Table, having failed the quest for the Holy Grail due to the fact that he tried to kill his brother, and he actually fought against Arthur a handful of times. In the movie, though, he is loyal to the point where he dies defending Arthur from the movie's villain. And who is the villain of this Arthurian tale? Mordred? Morgana, perhaps? No, no, it's this random, balding ginger named Rubert. Now, on the one hand, this kind of makes sense. The primary villain in Lynette's tale is the Red Knight, so if Rubert is the Red Knight, then that's fine. Of course, he's never referred to by this title, and his name is literally just the Latin word for red, so I'm not exactly impressed. What would be far more impressive is if they'd actually called him Sir Ironside, which is the name of one of the Red Knights in Le Morte d'Arthur, I think there's two, but Sir Ironside is the one that features in Lynette's story. Or they could have just referred to him as the Red Knight at any point and given him a vaguely Arthurian-sounding name, even. But no, he's just... red. Anyway, ten years pass, and Rubert tries his hand at taking over Camelot again. He sends his griffin to steal Excalibur, which works. Except then Merlin's falcon Aiden intercepts him, and makes him drop it in the Forbidden Forest. This is what kickstarts the plot and Kaylee's quest to retrieve Excalibur and save Camelot. 
Robert's plan, on the other hand, involves threatening Juliana so she'll lead his men to Camelot, where the gates will open for her because Arthur promised she and Kaylee will always have a place there. So, essentially, a Trojan wagon train, if you will. Of course, on this trip, Kaylee picks up a couple of friends and a love interest. The main point of interest here is naturally Garrett, her love interest, and a blind hermit who's made the Forbidden Forest his home. But before we get to him, I do briefly want to touch on Devon and Cornwall, a pair of dragons who are also conjoined twins. Yes, they are comedic relief, and yes, they fall into just about every comedic stereotype about conjoined twins I've ever seen. They are polar opposites of one another, they cannot agree on anything, and argue constantly. They start their presence in the movie essentially hating each other's guts. They also start off with a really distasteful joke from Devon about how they're the reasons cousins shouldn't marry. Now, don't get me wrong, obviously, incest carries a lot of risks of complications for any potential offspring. Just look at the Habsburgs if you don't believe me. But conjoined twins are not one of them. In fact, conjoined twins are so rare that we literally don't know what exactly causes the twins to either not split entirely or fuse back together. There's just not enough data. It just put a bad taste in my mouth for the literal introduction of these characters. Aside from that, though, they somehow ended up with entirely different accents from one another. They're not identical, despite the fact that all conjoined twins are identical, and for a vast portion of the movie, they can't fly or breathe fire because they can't agree on anything. So, obviously, their character arc involves learning to work together and actually communicate with each other. Honestly, I'm being a bit generous when I say character arc, because really all that happens is they get introduced to Kaylee, get attached to her, and use the fact that both of them care about her to work together. They don't solve their interpersonal problems at all. They don't talk about how they might both be able to pursue their dreams, or how they're going to share their lives. Nothing actually gets solved, they just agree that they both love Kaylee, and therefore they're fine now? As I said, not exactly the strongest character arcs in existence. Despite all of that, though, when briefly, at the end of the movie, they have the chance to be separated, they actively make the choice not to. They don't even need to talk about it, they just look at each other and decide that no, that's not for them. That one point is actually something I didn't expect and deeply respect. Because, yeah, not all conjoined twins want to be separated. I would have expected these two to maybe want to, given they had an entire musical number about it, but at the end of the day, it's one of the few times I've seen disabled characters actively choose to reject a magical cure when one is literally dumped in their laps, so I'm not going to complain. And while Devon and Cornwall may be kind of a rough showing, Garrett was, for the most part, a welcome surprise. Like most characters in this movie, his characterization is a little wishy-washy, but as a disabled character, he is honestly not terrible. Garrett is a fusion of two characters from the book, Gareth and Lucius. He is also more plainly just Gareth the Arthurian Knight. In the tale of Lynette and Lyonesse, he is the love interest of Lyonesse, Lynette's sister, while Lynette herself marries his brother, Gaheris. He is also, notably, King Arthur's nephew, none of which is relevant to Garrett because he is an only child and a former stable boy. Possibly that is a callback to Gareth being initially presented to Lynette as a kitchen servant, possibly just the thing he did before he left Camelot to become a hermit. Gareth's story goes thusly. He was a stable boy with dreams of one day becoming a knight. Until, during a fire in the stables, one of the horses kicked him in the head and he lost his vision. After that, the only person who still believed in him and encouraged him was actually Sir Lionel, so when Lionel died, Garrett left Camelot to go live in the Forbidden Forest. In the Forbidden Forest, he was found by Aiden, who became his seeing eye bird, and taught him how to navigate the woods and all their peculiarities. Notably, Aiden is not a talking bird. 
he's just unusually intelligent and possibly Merlin's familiar. Anyway, Garrett grew up, learned the Forbidden Forest like the back of his hand, and that's where he's at by the time he enters the story proper. His characterization, much like that of basically any character in this movie, bar the villain, only because he's about as two-dimensional as cartoon villains get, is a bit weak, shall we say? The movie desperately wants us to believe he is a hardened, mistrustful loner who would prefer to stay in his woods with his bird. He has an entire musical number when he's first introduced about how he stands alone and doesn't need anyone. But all it takes for Kaylee to convince him that they should team up is basically nothing. I stand alone too. Aiden. I just need your help this once. All right, all right. After that, he very quickly loses any kind of loner attitude he was going for, only splitting from the party once Camelot is in sight, because he's already been rejected by the city once, and doesn't want to put himself through that again. Which is less of a loner thing to do, more of an understandable response to trauma. As a disabled character, though, he's a lot more solid than I was expecting. Looks-wise, he's got the milky eyes that everyone likes to give their blind characters. It doesn't make much sense for him, given his blindness was caused by a head injury, but what can you do? Also, I find it really funny, in a harsh sort of way, that the creators didn't give him eyes that don't look blind, and still had one of the first things Kaylee says to him be a complaint about how he's not looking at her. She apologizes as soon as she realizes how badly she's put her foot in it, of course, and they move on, but still. In terms of how he moves and navigates, Garrett is, as far as I can tell, a decent shot, especially for the late 90s. He has a stick he's fashioned into a cane to check his path, and Aiden, being a magical bird with near-human intelligence, is a very effective seeing eye bird. I especially like how in situations like when they're running away from the dragons, you can actively see how Aiden helps him, flying from safe spot to safe spot and marking them by vocalizing. Aiden does a lot of vocalizing to warn and guide Garrett, something which actually becomes relevant to the plot briefly when Kaylee gets upset and won't stop arguing with him, leading to him missing one of Aiden's calls and getting shot. <laughs> This leads to a scene where he touches Kaylee's face, and it's implied he's seeing her through that. That whole thing is actually a little bit of a myth, but seeing as this is a part of an intimate moment between them, where it wouldn't actually be weird for him to touch her face, I don't actually think it's that egregious. There are some moments where it kind of seems like they're falling into the common misconception that blind people have better hearing and sense of smell than everyone else. It's not actually true. Sure, removing one sense allows you to focus with more clarity on the others, but it doesn't actually do anything to improve the baseline. But again, Aiden is always there to provide him very notable auditory cues, and when he notices a smell the other characters don't, it's because he has vastly more experience in the terrain they're in. Most of the things he does in this movie feel grounded in some sense of realism, at least. Except for the moment in the climax where he decides to try and drive a cart, but that was a bit of a tense situation overall and had predictably disastrous results. And also, he didn't choose to end up in the cart, he was literally dropped into it. What's most notable about Garrett, though, is that in the end, when magic is sweeping across Camelot, undoing all of Rubert's sorcery and briefly separating the Dragon Twins, it's never even hinted at touching Garrett. He doesn't get his sight back as a reward for heroic deeds. He gets to be a hero, become a knight, and still be blind. He gets to be the attractive romantic love interest, and be disabled. And this is where I unfortunately briefly have to return to the King's Demoiselle. cell. A change was made between Garrett and Lucius, one of the characters he's based on, that is extremely relevant to this conversation. Because Lucius has a very different ending. He is dying, and when presented with something that could save his life, he actively chooses to become sighted for the little time he has left instead. 
so he can tell the main character she's pretty right before fucking off this mortal coil or whatever. Disgusted? I am revolted? I dedicate my entire life to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and this is the thanks I get? I am never reading this book. I am so beyond grateful that apparently someone in the writer's room had enough sense to look at that and call it for the absolute BS that it is. Despite the somewhat inconsistent characterization and the general lackluster feel of the entire movie, I will admit to having just the tiniest bit of a soft spot for Garrett now that I've revisited this movie as an adult. He's a bland, inconsistently written, handsome love interest in a very expensive flop of an animated movie. Which fills me with warm fuzzy feelings for reasons I can't quite explain. Maybe it's because he's such a normal character. He's a bargain bin Disney prince. There's about a thousand of those floating around out there. He just happens to also be disabled. It's just weirdly nice to have a disabled character who is bad in the way other characters often are, instead of the ways I've come to expect. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye!